Continuation of Life Study, Matthew, Message 33. The Lord seemed to be saying to the Pharisees, Your blasphemy is not forgivable. I cast out the demon by the Spirit of God, but you say that I cast it out by Satan, the king of the demons. You go too far in saying this. You have uttered a blasphemy that is unforgivable. You have not merely insulted the spirit or disobeyed the spirit, but you have blasphemed the spirit. He is the spirit of God, even God himself. I cast out the demon by God himself as the spirit. Yet you say that this God is Satan, the king of the demons and the king of the dirty flies of the dunghill. In saying this, you have committed an unforgivable sin. Speaking against the Holy Spirit, not forgiven in this age or in the coming age. In verse 32, the Lord continued, And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him neither in this age nor in the coming one. In the economy of the triune God, the Father conceived the plan of redemption. The Son accomplished redemption according to the Father's plan, and the Spirit reaches sinners to apply the redemption accomplished by the Son. If the sinner blasphemes the Son, as Saul of Tarsus did, the Spirit still has the ground to work upon him and cause him to repent and believe in the Son that he may be forgiven. But if the sinner blasphemes the Spirit, the Spirit will have no ground to work upon him, and there will be none left to cause him to repent and believe. Hence, it is impossible for such a person to be forgiven. This is not only logical according to reason, but governmental according to God's administrative principle, as revealed here by the Lord's word. In God's governmental administration, His forgiveness is dispensational. For His administration, He has planned different ages. The period from the first coming of Christ to eternity is divided dispensationally into three ages. This age, the present one, from Christ's first coming to his second coming, the coming age, the millennium, the 1,000 years for restoration and heavenly reigning, from Christ's second coming to the end of the old heaven and old earth, and eternity, the eternal age of the new heaven and new earth. God's forgiveness in this age is for sinners' eternal salvation. This forgiveness is given both to sinners and believers. God's forgiveness in the coming age is related to the believer's dispensational reward. If a believer, after being saved, commits any sin, but will not make a clearance through confession and the cleansing of the Lord's blood, before he dies or the Lord comes back, this sin will not be forgiven in this age, but will remain to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. He will not be rewarded with the kingdom to participate in the glory and joy with Christ in the manifestation of the kingdom of the heavens, but will be disciplined to make a clearance of this sin and will be forgiven in the coming age. This kind of forgiveness will maintain his eternal salvation, but it will not qualify him to participate in the glory and joy of the coming kingdom. The tree known by the fruit in verse 33, the Lord said, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For by what, by the fruit the tree is known. A tree is known by its fruit. That the Pharisees were evil was exposed by their evil deeds. The mouth speaking evil out of the abundance of the heart. Verses 34 and 35 say, Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good man out of the good treasure brings forth good things, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. The Pharisees were filled in their hearts and with the abundance of evil. Hence, their mouth uttered the evil out of their heart. Every idle word to be accounted for in the day of judgment. Verse 36 says, And I say to you that every idle word 
which men shall speak, they shall render account concerning it in the day of judgment. The Greek word rendered idle is argos, composed of two words, a meaning not and ergon meaning work. An idle word is a non-working word, an inoperative word, having no positive function, useless, unprofitable, unfruitful, and barren. In the day of judgment, those who speak such words will render account concerning every one of them. Since this is the case, how much more must men account for every wicked word? The Lord seemed to be telling the apostles, Be careful with your speaking. Every idle word, every unimportant word will be judged. There will be a day of judgment, and whatever you say will be judged at that time. This is a very serious matter. By words, people being either justified or convicted. In verse 37, the Lord concludes, For by your words shall you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be convicted. What a warning this is. We must learn to control and restrict our speaking. The opposing Pharisees were not only defeated, but also subdued. They did not have a case. Whenever the Lord Jesus gives an answer, there is no more argument. Life study of Matthew, message 34, the establishment of the king's rejection. In this message, we shall consider chapter 12, verse 38 to 50, the sign to the rejecting generation. The rejecting generation wanting to see a sign. Because the Pharisees could not argue with the Lord Jesus, they changed the subject seemingly from the negative side to the positive side. Verse 38 says, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you, because they could not defeat the Lord Jesus by arguing. To save face, they changed the subject from one thing to another. They asked the Lord for a sign. This was a subtle proposal. A sign is a miracle with some spiritual significance. The Jews always seek for signs. Once Again, this gave the Lord the opportunity to reveal to the whole universe something further concerning himself.